so welcome to the webinar. My name is uh, Ron Myers. I'm the director of editorial here at Joe. Um, and today we're going to be having uh, an update webinar from uh, Dr. Sullen at the unit uh, at the University of Dusseldorf. So he published with with us a few years back um, on expansion microscopy and measuring me measuring various potasitic proteins like actin, various others. Um, so he's going to be providing an update on the on the technique um, that it's happened happened over the last few years. Any any uh, variations of the technique? Um, we will be recording the webinar, so we'll we'll send out the recording after after the webinar today. And if you have um, any questions, we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. And we can also address things by email afterwards um, if you have any additional questions. All right, so take it away, Dr. Sellen. Hello, everyone, um, and a welcome from me also. I'm happy to um, provide our experiences and thoughts um, from the last um, years to you if, as you are interested in expansion microscopy. And it was triggered by a uh, publication from our group in um, 2021 um, about the renal proteins. Within the next um, 30 minutes, I would like to talk about the basic function and physical limits of the light microscopy, which triggered the um, invention of this technique, um, its capabilities, and also the two competing techniques, which are more pricey, like super resolution microscopy, which led to the um, Nobel Prize. Um, and I will try to show you the typical workflow for expansion microscopy. How do you process your probes? Um, the potential and frequent problems um, will be uh, mentioned. And finally, I would like to show you some outlooks for further developments, what you can do and what can be expected. And if you have thereafter some questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer them as, as good as, as I can. So I would like to start off with a little mentioning of the kidney, if you are not so a kidney person, um, you might be not so totally familiar. The kidney is a complex organ with a very heterogeneous um, microscopic structure. And even if you go down on the more um, microscopic level, um, down to the capillaries, where you see here the podocytes or the glomerular epithelial cells and the primary and secondary food processes with the slit diaphragm in between, you will leave the um, uh, capabilities of light microscopy to visualize those structures. And therefore, there is an intrinsic need if you want to see something in, on high resolution, like here, the slit diaphragm, you need so far electron microscopy. And it could be envisioned also at the macula densa up here um, between the tubular structures and the vascular structures that um, how the secretion and um, uh, substance exchange between the structures um, will be organized. Um, you need a high resolution microscopy to visualize those. This can of course be transferred to other organ systems with um, small and delicate structures in addition. If we would be capable in visualizing it on a um, molecular or even atomic level, we could see a slit diaphragm like here of the glomerular slit and we are looking from the Baumann's capsule space on top to the, of the slit diaphragm, and we would see here nephrine molecules. Um, we will um, visualize them later on in cell culture. Um, you see some images, and um, even in some mouse uh, specimen, you see the um, anchoring protein, the podosin there. And um, the normal light microscopy fails to visualize those. You, um, so far, you needed to have um, electron microscopy. This is not an electron microscope. It began all a long time ago um, with the first microscope, which you are seeing here. Um, it was invented by Antony van Leeuwenhoek, a Netherlands um, scientist who was very gifted um, to live for a long time, um, more than 90 years. Um, he was living at that age in nearly a Methuselah. And um, how did it work, this microscope? Please focus on this was, um, the pin was the stage for the probe to be positioned. And this is the magnifying glass. 
and it was held upright against the sun and it was and the um, observer was looking um, on the probe through the lens and hopefully not burning the um, retina and on the retina he would see an inverted image of the specimen this is from a German medical dictionary a joke um, entry about um, a little insect eating up the stone that was called Petrofraga Lorioti. I'm a German comedian who was not is not living anymore. Um, so probably was he was not seeing this object, but transferring it to the kidney. Um, so far, the uh, microscope techniques techniques have advanced, and you are seeing here um, some scheme of the glomerular situation. This is from lupus nephritis. I picked this one in a schematic way, and you see the images, the um, microscopic images um, right adjacent to it, um, where you see so many different changes, which um, you can see in um, the typical light microscopy, uh, but also for the podocytes, you need the electron microscopy. So you have here a renal disease, which demands for different microscope techniques as the standard light, mi light microscope is not sufficient to give the adequate resolution. Other proteinuric diseases like minimal change disease or membranous disease um, with uh, all protocytic diseases. Here you see the typical three-layered structure or here. You have here the capillary lumen. That would be the blood flow. The filtration direction would be upwards. In this way, you cross the filtrate will cross the um, Bauman's, uh, the, sorry, the basal membrane. And on top of the basal membrane, you have usually healthy photocytes sitting with the um, put prostheses and in between the slit diaphragm. You will see in more understandable image later, the diseased ones are um, so um, more difficult to see. Here you see a photocyte, here are food processes. And um, you have also here some storage diseases like amyloidosis with um, a lot of folded proteins um, obstructing um, the structure and causing proteinuria. There is a problem with a um, light microscopy and it's a problem attri attributed to the physical limits of the visual light. Um, it's the diffraction limit, meaning um, how close can be two um, single spots be apart from each other to be recognized as two different spots or other way around? When do they fuse together because our resolution capabilities are insufficient? And we, as we use the light as the carrier of information about our specimen, um, we depend on those physical properties of the visual light. And you see here, um, I picked um, the German scientist who was a co-founder of um, Zeiss, um, that was, um, uh, who made the microscopes mainly in Europe. Um, and you see here um, the wavelength of the visual light from the short wavelength range in ultraviolet to um, infrared with the long wavelength. And there are two physical um, properties that control the uh, diffraction limit. And um, it's the numerical aperture of the um, objective, and it's the wavelength of the used light. And this multiplied by a, a constant call um, to Mr. Abe, it is 0.5. Rayleigh used um, 0.61, so close to each other. We would have, if we use, would use a um, favorable wavelength of about 500 nanometers, um, we would have, a, and with an objective with a numerical aperture of 1.2, we would have a diffraction limit of um, 280 nanometers. So points being separated by 208 nanometers, um, that's the closest they can be where they are just. Um, being recognized as separate points. Something closer together than two, 208 nanometers will be seen as one point, um, although they are in fact two different points, but we cannot um, discriminate between, between those. As I said, it was not only um, Abby who found, um, 
found this um, to be true and the nature behind the diffraction limit. It was Rayleigh and there are informations from Sparrow. And um, you um, will see the term, um, the FWHM, um, which, which, is, which is the width or the distance between points at the um, half or 50% of the maximum intensity of the signal. That is um, coming up later on again to um, discriminate the res resolution capabilities of the um, technique. What can we see with these techniques? Um, if you can um, enhance the resolutions, and I will just focus for you on the upper part here, the nuclear pores, you can see even the substructure of nuclear pores. Um, you can see um, uh, focal adhesions on high resolutions, and I will later on show you also synaptic gaps and the vesicular transport, which you can visualize and um, magnify into. So you have the feeling to see really on a very low level what is happening in a um, uh, subcellular or um, small structural um, uh, region of the cell specimens. But you see here the diffraction limit and um, projected um, with um, high-end microscopy on the various um, biological samples like an average um, cell, smaller cell um, around 10 micrometers um, or even being larger or erythrocytes being smaller, something like eight, eight microns. You have bacteria a little a bit above one micron. You have the micro mitochondria, which are just being seen um, by the resolution of a light microscope. And then below the light microscope fails to um, give you the capability to visualize those objects like, viru like um, virus particles or even single molecules or on an atomic level here, you are definitely in a high um, end electron microscopy range. This changed um, with the invention of STED and STORM and PALM and all its derivatives of the super resolution microscopy studies, um, which um, use special, uh, special instruments, special lasers, uh, their controls, and special dyes um, to use the visual physics of visual or special light, like laser light. Um, and special dyes who flash from time to time um, to overcome the diffraction limit. And you can go down um, to a smaller resolution and give up um, and, and pr produce um, high resolution images of um, ultrastructural images like um, uh, the nuclei or mitochondria or plasma membranes. And um, Stefan Hell received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry together with his um, colleague who invented, one was the guy for Stead, the other one for Storm. And um, this was um, the novelty to just how, how yeah. somehow trick the limits of the diffraction limit. Um, and th since then, several different microscopy techniques um, which are reviewed here evolved. Up here, you see the light um, microscopy techniques um, with some additional um, data processing needed, um, which is an important issue for the super resolution microscopy of STED and STORM also that you need um, high end computing to receive the images and it's not a fast imaging, that's another problem of the techniques. But here you see that you're in a range of 200 nanometers of resolution, the diffraction limit of light. Tricking it by stat and storm, you go down to something like um, 10, 20 nanometers. Um, and then you have the um, capabilities to get, become even better with um, palm and um, its sister techniques. The expansion microscopy will give you at its best a um, resolution up to 25 nanometers. Um, I will explain to you how to do that um, within the next slides. Some applications of the um, neuron um, area are, for example, um, on the outgrowth of an axon, the synapses, like the synaptic cleft here, 
um, which are very interesting for the technique because you can um, um, have the, such a good resolution that you can see the single vesicles. So the um, expansion microscopy and gives you the capability to resolute um, to have a resolution down to here um, to visualize those objects. How do you do that? The first steps are um, not different from any other immunofluorescent labeling of your probe. It might be necessary that needs to be clarified in individual cases to um, do a certain fixation um, or buffering, but in general, um, the, a good immunofluorescent labeling is the key process for um, starting off the labeling of your sample after normal fixation, no special treatment needed there. This um, second important thought you have, or there are two other important things we will focus on that later on again, are you need to think of what will you label, how abundant is the antigen, and what kind of secondary um, are you using, um, uh, what kind of dye, and what, um, because not um, that's a special issue for expansion microscopy, but every dye is compatible with the chemicals you will lose, use um, for especially expansion microscopy. Um, so, but first of all, we just not talking about the exceptions, but the general, um, you dye your sample and then you will um, do a cross-linking called anchoring of your, um, your, la your label protein, your fluorescently labeled protein um, will be anchored with an um, aquilil X, the ACX, um, to, a, to form a fixed um, compound, which is um, then this complex will be then embedded within an hydrogel, which is a simple polyacrylamide mixture, um, which is then polymerizing slowly. And this is then your carrier for the labels. You need that because you will destroy the, the structural matrix of the probe you're having of the cell, the cytoskeleton, or if you have a tissue, also the extracellular matrix will be digested away by proteinases and elastases. Um, only your labeled um, probe that is then anchored to the hydrogel will be giving you the signal and um, initially reflecting the structure it has been before um, the treatment, but um, then the labeled probe within the hydrogel matrix um, can be used um, after the digestion, which is called here homogenization. Um, it will be then transferred into an hyperosmotic medium and the gel will simply expand. And for the standard expansion microscopy, you can expect to have a physical expansion between the normal state of your probe to the expanded state of up to um, a 4.5 fold factor. So you do simply do a pre-expansion of your probe before you go to the standard microscopy. So um, the diffraction limit um, is not an issue um, so much because you in pre magnification by physical expansion of your probe. Then um, how do you do that? Um, you are, um, we are now back, sorry. We are now at the stage um, of immunolabeling. Anchoring has been done and the labeled and anchored probe is then transferred on your um, hydrogel casting um, slide. You use, um, the cover slips as a spacer. You, with a diamond knife, you cut um, little stripes of your cover, cover slips and you use a simple uh, um, little water layer to do some adhesive contact and you build your chamber. Um, within this chamber, which you have built with two layers of the um, spacing cover slip, um, uh, cover slips, you um, enter your probe with the cells sitting on them, which have been previously immunolabeled and anchored. And on top of that, here in just for visualization with, um, with the green color, you um, put your hydrogel and then you, um, to make it, um, or put it into a decent form, 
you cover the whole thing and, th and therefore it also does not dry out um, with a cover slip that has been wrapped into parafilm. And then you let the whole thing sit and polymerize and um, uh, thereafter you uh, remove the chamber and you homogenize the probe by proteinized K digestion. And if it's um, a tissue a specimen, you use um, elastases in addition um, to, um, yeah, to digest away to um, the re retraction forces um, that would be counteracting the expansion. If it's working, here you have a sample of the whole thing of the specimen pre-expansion. Um, and after expansion here, you see a double label um, in addition. Um, here you only see the red label, but it's this frame before expansion. This is a factor of about twofold. Um, here you can see a label red is for um, actin and green is nephrine here in those um, cost cells. Um, and this is here to show you this slide to show you some problem with it. Um, uh, as you can already see here, uh, little rupture gaps here are more. Here you, you can see them even more obviously. And um, here are they um, even marked on another specimen where you can see that um, this, um, during expansion, the probe ruptured. That happens if they are incomplete, for example, can happen if they're incomplete, completely digested. Um, another issue is, um, and here for um, as a pitfall for the um, technique, um, the fading or loss of um, fluorescent capabilities of your dye. Um, first, we start out with um, fusion proteins. Here, the um, group um, uh, of Tilburg and colleagues um, made an effort to find out which um, probe is fading by um, the treatment of the um, expansion microscopy. And um, if you just look, for example, for um, enhanced CFP, you have a um, great loss of signal intensity. Um, even here, um, with this, uh, just for the treatment, no expansion has been done so far. It's just the chemical treatment. So um, fluorescent proteins, um, mainly and there are some exceptions like the um, cerulean 3, um, which is not so sensitive to it, but the majority is very sensitive for a signal loss. Um, so you need to, um, if you use um, fluorescent fusion proteins, you will have to have decent antibodies, primary and secondaries to do it. And that the secondaries can, um, here you see it in a quantitative um, display how much fluorescent intensity you will lose for certain proteins, but um, also using um, chemical substances like um, synthesized um, dyes, there is a pitfall, especially for the um, 647 um, uh, dyes, um, and all Psi 3 and Psi 5 dyes are affected also. Um, it's the treatment either of um, with an acrylyl X, which you need for the cross-linking, or, um, or and the proteinase K treatment that will destroy the dye. Um, so you have to avoid um, um, the 6 for 7 dyes and the Psi 3 and Psi 5s. And also you should take into account, it does make a different difference if you use an Alexa 546, for example, um, with a high um, yield of fluorescence um, in comparison to some weaker um, dyes like the 4AA. So if you have a rather rare antigen, take a more efficient dye to make it visible than an abundant um, uh, antigen, which um, can also be seen with a less um, uh, the less prominent um, secondary dye. That might be helpful for planning your exper experiment if you have the opportunity to choose the color um, depending on the primary antibody. Um, how did we do that? We labeled um, in a cell culture experiment. Here you see um, expanded cells for the um, podosin in green, in, in green 
with an um, Alexa 488. The podosin, um, uh, the nephrine is in, labeled in red. And the actin is also a special issue I didn't mention so far. It's a tricky one because the standard staining you usually find for normal fluorescent microscopy is um, using a phalloidin. But phalloidin is too small. It's uh, the toxin from the uh, very poisonous uh, mushroom. Mm -hmm. And um, it interacts with the actin cytoskeleton, the filamentous, um, our, uh, filamentous um, actin, um, but it is too small um, to be uh, that, uh, so that it can't be anchored by the ACX and then you wash it away. Um, so there are special, special actin dyes um, for EXM. You can uh, choose and pick which it's listed here in the method table. Um, and then you can even use um, digital um, further um, zooming and then you reach um, a range of about 70 um, nanometers typically for the EXM. Here you see probes, um, a, a labeling of podosin of a mouse glomerula and those are an, in total um, seven images with an increasing um, magnification. This is a 10x my, um, objective and then we go up um, here to the um, 63 fold um, magnification. And here you've already get the um, feeling that you're looking on a capillary and you might even see or could envision that here could be um, the glomerular slit membrane labeled. That it is possible, not in this image, but uh, on other um, publications, you can see it here from Schulzinski and colleagues um, uh, uh, of, from Seattle, um, a Department of Chemistry and Nephrology together, they could um, label um, also mouse glomeruli and its slit diaphragm um, using a podosing dye. And that might even remember us of the, um, from Rodewald and colleagues published zipper light structure of the glomerular slit membrane with its 40 um, uh, um, angstrom, it should be 40 nanometers in, in space, the filtration pore from, this is from nine, um, seven, 1974. That was even transferred this knowledge and technique to um, the renal pathology. And you can see here um, a human specimen from healthy, um, individuals um, with the labeling of the um, glomerular slit and the, um, filter, and the glomerular filter. And if you transfer, here you see a healthy one with an, um, an, a healthy glomerular um, filtration barrier. Here you have the um, capillary lumen, you have the basement membrane, and of, on top of the basement membrane, as the last barrier for the filtration, you have the glomerular um, epithelial cells and the secondary food processes um, with their um, very orderly um, arrangement on top of the basement membrane. And this is the standard so far, the electron microscope. And comparing to this, you have here um, the expansion microscopy, the standard expansion microscopy technique. And here you can see um, that um, you are not perfectly as good as the EM, but you are getting very close. This is for the normal individual here on the left side. On the right side, you see it for a minimal change disease and typical um, disease of the glomerular um, epithelial cells. They um, have an effacement. They lose their secondary delicate structure and um, it, they seem to fuse, but um, in, despite the optical um, sensation or um, presentation of being very tight. It's very leaky. That's a um, disease with a lot of um, protein loss. They have massive proteinuria. And if you do a um, densitometric analysis through the podocyte um, food processes, you see that um, the expansion microscopy does the similar job as the electron microscopy can. So far, it hasn't entered um, routine pathology um, Take, um, uh, 
testing. Um, from going from there on, we stop now by an additional magnification of a 4.5 fold. We are going further to um, for, for the last few slides. Um, how where's the future? Um, it's the X10 EXM. Um, here you're using in, in, instead of the um, polyacrylamide um, gel, you use um, a DMMA a DMAA gel and you degas it um, because the oxygen um, distracts and the um, purity of the gel and it don't won't expand as well. And with this technique, you can look into the synaptic cleft and you can even see the vesicles. And um, you see here without um, the, the um, without um, expansion microscopy, you see a confocal image, very blurry. Um, and classical expansion microscopy with a four to 4.5 fold expansion does it a little bit better, but the 10x um, increases the resolution by far. So you have a um, uh, diffraction uh, um, discrimination limit of around 22 nanometers. And if you deconvolute this one again, as seen here, you can even see a very clear um, image of um, the object and compare compared to storm or stead um uh, this is even a better result so there is a um, niche for this imaging technique to have high resolutions of very small objects um, in bioscience what are the um, advantages of expansion microscopy you can reach a magnification up to 10,000 fold you can do that's a big plus um, a multicolor labeling of probes I told you three labels you can go up with more um, an advantage to um, um, in comparison to um, storm stead or um, um, electron microscopy where you're much more um, restricted um, you can use even a conventional fluorescent microscope. Confocal is an, um, a plus, but not a necessity. You can use mainly standard antibodies. It's a fast image acquisition because you take one image. And therefore, it's a, um, imaging on high resolution with relatively low costs. Um, disadvantages are, can be, not all fluorescent dyes are compatible. Um, you have the risk of rupture artifacts during expansion. Rare antigens are more difficult to be seen. You have to keep in mind that if you expand your probe, you, um, uh, uh, you have a dilution by just expanding the number of molecules you can stain um, by, if you do a tenfold expansion, then you have an um, at least tenfold in each dimension expansion of your pro of of your uh, molecules, but you don't increase the number of molecules, so you will reduce the um, detection uh, um, limit of your antigen. And um, you are not very free in when you want to take the images. Um, in our hands, it's very um, you're very well recommended um, if you image very soon after um, your probes are finished. So far, thank you for your attention. I hope it was informative to you and I'm very happy to take your questions if there are any. And I will have a look into the questions. Um, yes, there are protocols. Here's one question. Um, could paraffin blocked uh, tissues be used? Um, it, there are protocols out that you deparaffinate those. Um, they are usually parafarm aldehyde fixed. Um, and you can do the um, procedure on those. Um, shouldn't be a problem. We didn't do it so far, but um, we do know about um, many protocols out there that um, see no problems with it. Uh, the other question. Yeah, it, I, I totally agree. It's an excellent method. <laughs> um, uh, it's very handy, easy to do, um, easier to do, um, and organoid staining. Um, it depends on the uh, dimensions of the organoid. organoid. Um, it could be necessary the um, it, how big it is in in the three dimensional structure. If it's getting um, 
on a 3D wise term too large, then you get very blurry images because you have a signal contribution from every Z plane and that is blurring into it. Um, so depending on the size of your um, specimen, um, you might um, need to embed it, um, for example, as a frozen section and section that and then stain the section. Um, that would be probably the safer way to go. But if you have very tiny ones that are single or double cell layer, um, I, I just would stain them straight away after fixation. Um, um, there's a question about what should we be careful about the, to achieve uniform expansion. That has been a very big issue initially when the um, uh, method um, was pretty new. And there are a couple of papers out there that you should not be very concerned about it. If you, um, yeah, I think that's the easiest way to, to answer it. That you can read up a lot about it. That was obviously something reviewers were very concerned about that you have a kind of distortion of your specimen because it's not um, evenly expanding. Um, if it's properly digested, it will, um, bless you, it will be, um, it, evenly expanding um, and you won't, but there's no distortion um, has been addressed um, very frequently. Um, application of what, um, oh, there I need to, um, might be my language barrier, but what is meant by app 100 micron, application for 100 microns? Um, I, I do not, organ, organoid size. Okay, that's too big. Um, you need to embed and section. Okay, I understand, yeah, um, yeah. That's too big, by far too big. Um, you're welcome. Okay, Any, so these, yeah. these, these were all in the chat. Um, there's also two questions in the Q&A section. Oh, sorry, didn't no, see okay. well. they just they just appeared a second ago. Okay. Unlike... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, um, so um, Michael asked, can you share tips on locating the field of view post expansion? Um, uh, the, the one nobody wants to hear. Um, just um, being a good one in uh, finding the very um, very unusual forming cells and trying to find those again um, on your expanded slide. That's the way we did it initially. Um, now they are um, using KI, um, it's freely available. Available. I don't know if it's having in Fiji or image, A, image J, but there are plugins um, using KI just doing image analysis. And if you tell the with the upfront, um, pre-expanded stained image um, you, um, and you um, kind of uh, rasterize that image, you, um, you can have it found again, enlarged in the expanded one. And I would um, go for those if you, the quality of your images are good enough. And that's, um, it's, you, you have to confirm by with your own eyes again, or with a, it's on, um, computer then again, but it's easier to have the computer search it than doing it yourself. I hope that is a sufficient answer, but KI is the way to go. Yeah, how soon thereafter? Um, same day, I would say. Yeah, um, usually we let them expand um, overnight. Um, you need a couple of hours till it's um, sitting there um, uh, and you can do it overnight. And after that, I would um, definitely image them um, because you have a risk. Um, it's it's not a sterile technique. There's no necessity for being a, in a sterile condition, but um, it's a salty environment that is coming down to um, a, a good, good viability for everything that's around. And either it dries out um, or somebody else is coming in. All right. Well, I think that's it as far as questions. Um, so 
Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for your excellent questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Salen, for an excellent presentation. Um, so, awesome. yeah. And so we will send out an email of the recording after this. So you'll have that for your records. Um, and if you do have any other follow-up questions for us, um, feel free to reply to the email and we can um, we can address those there. All right. Thanks. Thanks again, everyone. And Thank have, you. have a great day. All right. Take bye care. Bye bye. Bye bye.